Is the United States of America really going to go to war with Russia and risk the possibility of an escalation to nuclear war for a country that it doesn't have a formal treaty with? And I think if you asked most Americans, there'd be a sense, no, I don't think we should do it, even though it seems so horrible. Troops are massed on borders and the threat and rumor of war lingers in Europe. What does the Bible have to say about all of this? Hi, welcome to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director, and I'm joined from Israel by Joel Rosenberg. Joel, it's great to have you on, and it's great to talk about the situation as it currently exists right now in Europe. Well, Carl, I appreciate it very much. And I, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a chilling situation where Russia seems to be heading this is, let's just say this right up front. We won't save this for just the end. Like, we need Christians all over the world to be praying uh, for peace, yeah. um, not just of Jerusalem, but do that too. But peace in Europe, that, uh, that the Lord would diffuse this, yeah. uh, this crisis that's building uh, between Russia and Ukraine. And um, because if this thing blows, uh, we'll have the largest war in Europe since World War II. Yeah. There are close to 150,000 Russian troops uh, massed along both the Russian-Ukrainian border, but also inside Belarus, which is a separate mm -hmm. and theoretically sovereign country, but a close ally of Russia, Russia, Putin. And that's actually where my family is from, from mm -hmm. Belarus. It, it is considered Russia historically, but it's a, its own independent country at, at the moment. Minsk is its capital. Yeah. And Russian troops are have been invited in by the Belarusian president to engage in war games. So it's a serious crisis. And, I, and, and a new report that just came out last week says if this thing goes full on, there could be 50,000 deaths in yeah. the theater and hundreds of thousands of uh, war refugees fleeing in every direction. Yeah. I mean, I think... For many of our listeners, they may be familiar with this, but let's set the stage a little bit. How did we get to this place with, you know, tens of thousands, over 100,000 troops, perhaps from Russia and Belarus, right on the border of Ukraine? And what does it really mean for the state of things in Europe right now? Well, if you ask a Russian, you're going to get a very different answer than asking a Ukrainian. And there are Russian, uh, ethnic Russians living in Ukraine because it was all one big unhappy family once, <laughs> uh, the Soviet Union, right? And at the collapse of the Soviet Union in, you know, on Christmas Day, uh, 1991, I believe it was, uh, that was the end of the Soviet Union for good. That's extraordinary. And Ukraine became its own independent country. Now, the Russian people and every Russian president, every Russian leader has always seen Ukraine as part of Mother Russia. It's not a separate country in their mind. It's theirs. And uh, there are deep uh, historical connections and roots. But of course, there was, you know, 70 some years of Soviet occupation of all the neighboring uh, countries. Why is that important? It's important because from the Russian mindset, from the mindset of the Kremlin, they don't see this as a foreign country that they're going to go invade. Putin, Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, sees this as a re- incorporating back into Mother Russia what is his, what is theirs. That's a problem. And, and there's an interesting geopolitical moment that, that happened when the Soviet Union collapsed, okay? Mm -hmm. You'll recall that uh, Bill Clinton was the president of the United States. In the years, at least, you know, it was, it was George H.W. Bush that was president when the Soviet Union fell. But when Clinton won in 1992 and became president in January of 1993, this was the time where things were sort of calming down, and now the question is, how do we sort of figure out the post-Cold War era, the post-Soviet era? Now, what happened is the Ukrainian government had on its territory nuclear weapons atop of high-speed, long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles. They were Soviet, right? The Russians considered after the Soviet Union collapse, they're ours. And the Ukrainians said, well, too bad. We're not going to point them at the Americans and NATO because we're friends with them. Mm -hmm. But we have been invaded and occupied so many times by you mm -hmm. in Russia 
that we're going to keep the nuclear weapons and that'll be our safeguard that you will never occupy us again. Now, what happened is that the Clinton administration brokered a deal mm-hmm. in which the Secretary of State and Vice President Gore and you know and, and Clinton himself all negotiated this deal where listen, 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 you can't keep nuclear weapons. That's just not going to be tenable for the rest of the world. We will be your ally. And as long as we are around, you don't have to worry. But please trust us. Give back the weapon because they're going to come for them. Like, it's just a problem. And the Ukrainians got a memo, but they never got a treaty. Yeah. They were not allowed to join NATO. So the Ukrainians took the deal. Mm -hmm. And now they are thinking, holy smokes, this is what we feared. That someday some Russian leader would threaten to take us over all over again. And we would have nobody to help us. We're not in NATO. So that means what's called Article 5, which is the bedrock foundational principle of NATO, it doesn't kick in. What is Article 5? If one country in in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is attacked, everybody will come to its defense, right? Ukraine is not part of NATO. And now the Biden administration is showing very little interest in helping to the extent that the Ukrainians feel they need help. And the neighboring NATO countries are basically trying to do a little bit to bolster their own defenses, lest Putin go crazy and attack everybody as well. But that's the situation that we're in. And again, I'm not trying to make a partisan point. I'm just trying to say, why does Putin feel tempted that this is the moment to go get the prize for which every Russian longs? And I think you'd have to argue, and and many analysts are, there's a perception that the Biden administration isn't up to the challenge of staring the Russians down. Now, in fairness to Biden, one more point, in fairness to him, you'd have to ask, well, if you don't have a treaty, is the United States of America really going to go to war with Russia and risk the possibility of an escalation to nuclear war for a country that it doesn't have a formal treaty with? And I think if you asked most Americans there'd be a sense, no, I don't think we should do it, even though it seems so horrible. Right. It is horrible. It is horrible. And I think we'll connect the dots from that point up. But it's fascinating to look at the longer history of Ukraine and Russia relations like this. I mean, at least in the 20th and 21st centuries, uh, you and I have both had the opportunity in previous lives to be in Ukraine and to be in Russia and to have conversations with people on the ground there. And I'd love to get your take on some of this. You know, I, I had a conversation a few weeks back, uh, as we were talking before, with a with a pastor in Ukraine who runs an orphanage uh, there, happened to be here in the U.S., and he was uh, explaining the situation that they face right now in his part of the Ukraine. He says, you know, my the kids uh, that he has at his orphanage can look out their window and see the Russian troops in the distance few hundred yards, literally a few hundred yards away. And it's really a tragic situation and a very, very threatening situation. Speak to the situation of the of the Ukrainian people and the vulnerability that they feel right now, um, especially as you mentioned, you know, the historical uh, promises made by prior administrations and so forth to them. Right. Well, yes, that, that's a great question, because this is not theoretical that the Ukrainians feel this way. There's there's history there, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is Putin has nearly 150,000 troops on the Ukrainian border. So it's not like we're just having some thought exercise. We're not playing risk where (laughs) there aren't any any forces moving. Like there are forces that are inbound and are right on the border and they're ready to go. And it's not often in history that a country will mobilize 150,000 or so troops and tanks and planes and all the logistics that go with it because that's expensive and then not attack you know it's not that it's never happened but that's the biggest risk we, we saw this in 1990 in the summer of 1990 saddam hussein moved a massive amount of troops and tanks and other you know artillery and uh, other logistical supplies right to the border of kuwait Now, at the time, I had just gotten married. I just moved to Washington. I had a job at a think tank uh, working for the senior vice president and director of research. 
who was an expert on Russia and uh, Russia. Uh, so I was thinking of it from Russian lenses, but this was the Middle East, which I was interested more in the Middle East than Russia. Now, what happened? Everyone said that Saddam Hussein, the leader of Iraq at the time, no, he he's not going to invade. This, when I say everyone, I mean nearly everyone in Washington, the, the, the establishment, foreign policy, national security class. Now, the people I was working with, they were much more worried. They were conservatives and therefore, you know, didn't trust Saddam as far as you could throw him. But the bottom line is, you know, most of the Washington establishment and Europe said there's not really a risk. The guy is just rattling, you know, his saber. He's just trying to drive up the price of oil. He's trying to intimidate his neighbors so that the neighbors do what he wants. He doesn't have to invade, literally. That's That would be insane. But he's going to get what he wants just by intimidating. And I remember thinking... Wow, I you know I don't have any letters after my name. I don't have a master's degree in this stuff. I don't have a PhD. But I'm just saying that looks like a guy who's about to invade. I mean, like, call me crazy, and people did. <laughs> and then, of course, on August second, nineteen ninety, Saddam invaded, and and literally the, the U.S. ambassador wasn't even there. She had right. gone on vacation, and. The American president was not there. He was, I think he was on vacation in Kenny Bunkport. But anyway, the point is, it looks an awful lot like that. Now, I'm praying that this thing gets dissipated. But there's one other point, and this is the point that you just made, which is not only is there the history of Russian invasion of Ukraine and occupation, yeah. but this happened just a few years ago. Right. Twice, right? What you're speaking of is there are two sections of Ukraine that have already been gobbled up by Putin, not by some distant czar a hundred years ago, not by the Soviet empire. I mean, that happened, but uh, mm -hmm. two seconds. One is uh, the region known as Crimea. That's basically a large island or peninsula, peninsula at the southern part of Ukraine. And the Russians just went in and got it a few years back. Then if that weren't bad enough, and you know, the world didn't do anything really, not significant. And so Putin watched, people are huffing and puffing, a few sanctions. Right. Nobody really cares. So then he moved into what's called the eastern region of Ukraine, known as the Donbass mm -hmm. region. This is where most ethnic Russians live, though they are citizens of Ukraine, and therefore they're Russian-speaking. They feel more loyal, mostly, mm -hmm. to Mother Russia, but it didn't really matter what they wanted. Putin went in and got it. Yeah. So he's done it twice in just the last few years. And what everybody's been worrying about since then is does Vladimir Putin really want to go get the whole thing or having gotten what he wants is now just trying to intimidate and get the Ukrainian government either to fall and get some sort of Russian pro -Russian, supported yeah. pro-Putin puppet regime or even if they don't fall, just get the Ukrainians to back away from the West to say we'll never join NATO, that we don't want any arms from NATO, that we won't s sign any more economic or political deals with the West, which would effectively make Ukraine a satellite country. That's what's got Ukrainians scared. And of course, everybody up and down Central and Eastern Europe who once were occupied by the Russians as the Soviet Empire, they're all terrified. Yeah. And that's where we are right now as you and I record this. Taking of Crimea and the Donbass region, was it 2014 or so? That, that time frame, and then uh, the world not reacting. But we've had further erosion of you know, our credibility as a nation when it comes to looking, other nations looking at us and in the world stage, you know, Afghanistan, our withdrawal, just, uh, we talked about this uh, several episodes ago about the chaotic and tragic withdrawal from Afghanistan. What does a weakened and less than effectively viewed United States do to embolden uh, leaders like Saddam Hussein and like Putin and maybe even like uh, Xi Jinping in China. How do these things all connect that way? Uh, it's a super question. I think it gets to the core of a lot of what I talk about. When we think about what the Bible says in Ezekiel 33, it talks about the importance of being a watchman on the wall, which means that 
uh, what, what the Lord says to the Hebrew prophet Ezekiel 2,600 years ago is he says, listen, I've appointed you to be a watchman. And so you need to be watching to see if there are threats coming, in his case, to Israel. But it's an, it's an applicable point anywhere, which is if threats are coming to a country, to a family, to an individual, to the church, then those who are tasked with having the responsibility of keeping a close eye on these things and then reporting back to the church, to the nation, whatever it is, you know, that's an enormously important responsibility because you may not be able to stop the attack, but you certainly can't stop the attack if nobody knows it's coming, okay? And God even says to Ezekiel, if you see a threat coming and you don't warn the people, a geopolitical threat, a spiritual threat, what, what have you, if you see it and you say nothing, this threat will come, people will die, they will perish, mm -hmm in their iniquities, that meaning they will die and go to hell, they'll be responsible for themselves for having not been a repentant person and have a, a working, a healthy relationship with the Lord. But you, watchman, you will have blood on your hands. You will be held to account. Now, mm. this is important because, no, I don't expect every pastor or ministry leader or lay person to be tracking all that's happening in Russia Mm -hmm. and China, and Iran, and North Korea, and Al-Qaeda, and ISIS, <laughs> you know, and all these other dangerous and evil yeah. uh, regimes or organizations. But those of us who, you know, have a little extra time on our hands and have that sense that, Lord, you seem to be using me to watch these things, track these things, and explain these things, then that's why we're activated. And that's mm -hmm. one of the roles, I believe, that the Joshua Fund plays Mostly in the Middle East, but my sense of what the Lord is asking of me over the years is actually a wider aperture uh, to be watching than just the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, in part because things that happen in Russia, China, North Korea, and elsewhere affects Israel and the Middle East. But as a follower of Jesus Christ and knowing how important this is to mobilize prayer in the church for any nation that's threatened— I'm watching these things. Uh, I just want to say one thing. You know, one of the things <laughs> that I've loved about the way you've talked about this in the past is when evil people say things, you actually take them at their word. And that has been a secret to the way in which your your fiction work has captured people's uh, imagination about these possibilities. But also in this context, it really does help understand some of the current conditions that we're in. So sorry, I'm uh, love no, no, to continue those points. No, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, great you know, point. that's would, a thing. Because you're right. A good piece of fiction, a political thriller, is really a, a work of psychology. Mm -hmm. It's not so much politics. You're trying to get inside the mind of evil people and how they think and what they, some crazy thing that they might do and how easy it is for sane people who are busy doing good things to miss the intention, much less the actions, of evil people. Yeah. One of the themes of my writing is this. To misunderstand the nature and threat of evil is to risk being blindsided by it. Wow. Right? The world was blindsided by Imperial Japan attacking the United States at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. We just didn't imagine it was even remotely possible. So we were blindsided. We were blindsided by Adolf Hitler. We shouldn't have been. He wrote Mein Kampf. He told us what he was going to do. But we just couldn't imagine that he would set into motion a war that would kill 50 million people worldwide and a systematic extermination of the Jewish people that killed 6 million Jews alone, just Jews. Yeah. We just People were blindsided by that. We were blindsided by Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait on August 2nd, 1990, and we were blindsided on September 11th, uh, 2001. It, and this is what happens. To misunderstand the nature and threat of evil is to risk being blindsided. Now, yeah. I'm looking at a world right now that's saying, oh gosh, I hope Putin doesn't invade, but he probably won't. <laughs> Look, I hope he doesn't. But I'm not talking about wanting it to happen or predicting it will happen. I'm talking about like going to battle stations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, you know, as you and I record this, um, I leave in a few days to uh, a neighbor of Russia. I'll be in 
Tallinn, which is the capital of Estonia, mm-hmm. which is one of those Baltic states that is right on the Russian border and has been invaded and occupied by the Russians and their psyches have been seared over the, the last hundred years or what have you of, of the trauma of being enslaved yeah. by Moscow. Now, you'll recall, this is not a promotion of, of my novel, but just since you mentioned the novels, you know, a few years ago, I wrote a, a, I started writing a series of novels, and the first in that series uh, was called The Kremlin Conspiracy. Mm-hmm. Now, The Kremlin Conspiracy, the basic premise is that what if a dictator in Russia, he wasn't named Putin in the book, but <laughs> what if some dictator in Russia decided, listen, I could invade Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and I could capture them in 96 hours. Mm-hmm. There had been a study by the Rand Corporation a few years back that said that, and I was like, wow, that's terrifying. Now, everybody would say, well, the current Russian regime, it, 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 nobody would invade an actual NATO country, much less three, because that would trigger Article 5, which would mean all of NATO, including the United States, would go to war, and now we'd be in a war with Russia, two nuclear armed powers. But my premise of the novel was, what if a Russian leader thought, really? Mm-hmm. First of all, I think the American president's too weak to do it. Mm-hmm. They you really going to go defend you? Estonia? Most Americans can't find Estonia on a map. Mm-hmm. And if I go invade them and I capture them, maybe I only capture one, maybe just Estonia. Is NATO really going to do this? They're really going to go- risk nuclear war with me to get it back? Mm-hmm. If they do, then we've got the biggest war in Europe since World War II. Yeah. But if they don't, if the United States and NATO doesn't go honor Article 5, what happens? That's the end of NATO. Mm-hmm. In 96 hours, a Russian leader, in this case, in real life, shifting from the novel, in real life, Vladimir Putin could invade one of these countries, own it in 96 hours, and if the United States and NATO doesn't go get it back, that's the end of NATO because everyone will know if you get invaded by the Russians, nobody's coming to help nobody's you. coming to help that you. premise is one of those premises that honestly Carl if I had just written an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal or the I don't know the Jerusalem Post or the Baltic Times or I don't know what <laughs> or given a speech yeah somewhere in Washington you know it'd be like a tree falling in the woods nobody <laughs> would hear it nobody would care but a novel captured the attention of yeah. Mike Pompeo and Pence and Vice President yeah. Pence. And I even presented the copy of the book to President Trump at the time. Now I haven't gotten a chance to meet Biden, but that's the book I would bring. Yeah, yeah for <laughs> sure. I think, the, I think the reality, Joel, is, you know, sometimes fiction in this context can open the door to a conversation around things that could potentially happen. And one of the Interesting. I liken your nonfiction and your fiction work to a revolving door where, where we're constantly going in and out of what's really happening with real people. And we've talked about those things in the past with real kings and real right. terrorist yeah, leaders and right. various other names and places and dates. But the fact is that when you see something that you are at the front end of in the Bible, uh, we called those people prophets. And I know you don't claim to be a prophet in any biblical well, sense. No, especially since the Joshua Fund is a non-profit. Non- organization. <laughs> We're a non-profit organization. But the idea that uh, in understanding the times and knowing what to do, there has to be a certain amount of interpretation of current events. And that's why it's so helpful for you to to kind of reflect on these things. And And again, we look at the people that are engaged in this. And you know, our work primarily focuses on the Middle East and, and you know, largely blessing Israel and the neighboring countries. But whenever we talk about something as geopolitical as this, the implications are pretty profound for Israel, for the region of the Middle East, and also for the United States. And maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of those, what would happen in a world where NATO disappeared because of the actions of a, a Russian or other world leader to, you know, disempower the United States and, and NATO. Well, look, I, I'll be candid with you, Carl. We may be heading to that place quickly, but even if technically 
NATO exists and technically the United States remains the world's only superpower, at any point in history, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican in, in the White House, if a president is not willing to use the power of the United States or at least convincingly threaten the power mm -hmm. of the United States and use every tool at its, at its disposal to thwart evil, then you're unleashing evil. The United States has become the restrainer of evil, not all, but the, maybe the biggest outbursts of, of evil since the end of the World War II. We won World War I for, for the world. We won World War II and liberated the concentration camps in alliance with other countries, admittedly. And at the time, you know, actually it was Russia. <laughs> it was the Red Army, the Soviet Army that that actually liberated Auschwitz, just to be historically accurate. Like we were coming in from both sides. The Russians got there first. So that was one good thing they did. That's good. And they helped us defeat Hitler. But they didn't plan to do that. Stalin made a deal with Hitler to take over all of Europe. And then Hitler thought, well, I'm winning. So now I'm going to go get Stalin. I'm going to go get Russia. That was a huge mistake. I mean, but thank God. It happened, and so in that case, the, uh, Moscow was our ally. So, well, look, there's a lot of implications here, but I think that a world without NATO and a world without the United States, even if they exist, and even if they're not literally disabled, if they're not willing to stand up to a bully, mm -hmm. to a thug, mm -hmm. then the thug's gonna move. And this is not the first time. We talked about uh, Crimea, we talked about Donbass, but, you know, a number of years ago during the Bush administration, right as the Olympics were beginning, it often happens this way, mm -hmm. uh, but in that case, President Bush, George W. Bush, was actually at the Olympics, and what happened? His national security advisor has to tell him, um, the Russians have just invaded Georgia. Yes. Uh, not Atlanta, not the U.S. state of Georgia, right. but the <laughs> former Soviet Republic of Georgia, and ended up uh, occupying, to this day, some 20% of Georgia. Of mm -hmm. course, the Russians have moved into and, and, and sent combat troops and planes and everything else into Syria. Mm -hmm. The Russians effectively control Syria. Now, they say that they're doing it to prop up their erstwhile ally, in the butcher of Damascus, mm -hmm. uh, Bashar al-Assad. But what are the implications for Israel? The implications is there's MiG fighter jets flying over Syria. Within sight, and, yeah. And the Russians are letting the Iranians move forces in, missiles. and all. A world in which the United States is backing up, is retreating, is a world in which the forces of evil, Russia, Iran, communist China, North Korea, and then the terrorist organizations decide to move. And as you and I record this, we're at a moment where, because of the perception of weakness in Washington at the moment, like... People who don't agree with me, fine, don't agree with me. But perceptions become reality. And the perception among the world's bad guys is that Biden and Kamala Harris are weak. Mm -hmm. Now, as Americans, I'm, I'm both American and Israeli, but bo as both, I'm praying for a strong Biden administration to be strong, to be tough. Peace right. through strength, right? If you, have, if you show strength and you have strength, you're more likely to keep the peace than if you look like, oh, please don't hurt us. So all that to say, the Russians right now are, I think Vladimir Putin is literally looking around thinking, well, if I took Ukraine, would Washington stop me? Right. He's calculating this. The Iranians are thinking, I know Washington wants me to, wants us to sign a new nuclear deal and promise to not go down the road of getting weapons. But honestly, maybe we should just break out and go build those weapons right now. Mm -hmm. Is Washington going to stop us? The Chinese, the communist Chinese, are thinking we've always wanted to grab Taiwan and make it back under our thumb, you know, under our control. And the Americans have always stopped us. But yes. maybe this is the moment. The only country that seems quiet right now among these uh, fearsome four would be North Korea, which is oddly <laughs> quiet, I will just say. But look, we'll take it while we can get it. And we need to be praying. One of the reasons I accepted this invitation to go up to Estonia is that there's going to be something called the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast. Mm -hmm. Now you say, Joel, you, you live in Jerusalem. Why would you be going to the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast? 
someplace else. Are you unaware? Of it? <laughs> okay, yes, I get it. Uh, annually, uh, evangelicals and Jewish Israeli leaders come together and have a Jerusalem prayer breakfast here in Jerusalem to encourage the nations to be praying for Israel. And by the way, you know, God is answering these prayers. We've talked about this on the podcast. We have six Arab-Israeli peace treaties now, four in just the last 18 months, yes. uh, right? So the Abraham Accords have been a huge answer to prayer and prophecy, in my view. Now, we need to keep praying, but what's happening is people, Christians who love Israel in other parts of the world have been inviting the leadership of the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast, hey, would you come and do like a two days worth of events, it's not just the breakfast, there's other sessions, so that we can sort of give a B12 shot to evangelicals and, and, and other Christians who love Israel or need to and want to understand what's going on and how do we stand with Israel and how can we educate and uh, persuade leaders in parliaments and pre you know palaces and so forth to stand with Israel closer. Why? Because of Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 through 3, in which there is a huge blessing that comes with blessing Israel and a curse that comes with cursing Israel. So this Jerusalem prayer breakfast upcoming in Estonia, which would probably be happening as, as people listen to this, but uh, but then we'll, we'll report from there as well, right. Lord willing. But uh, like they're having this, this event in the parliament and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a keynote speaker with an Orthodox rabbi who used to be a member of parliament here in Israel, uh, I'm, a, I'm a gentleman by the name of uh, Yehuda Glick, who is probably the leading expert and advocate for rebuilding the third temple in Israel. Uh, that's fascinating. He's a mm -hmm. fascinating guy. And he's so passionate about rebuilding the temple that a number of years ago, he was almost assassinated by a Palestinian terrorist who rode a motorcycle up to him pulled out a gun and fired point blank four bullets into his chest. Wow. Should have died, miraculously lived, and then decided to run for the Knesset, the, our wow. parliament, and uh, served for many years. I've gotten to know him. He's been to our home. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't believe what I believe about Yeshua, about Jesus. Mm -hmm. But on almost every other, other issue, we are quite simpatico. So we're, we're the keynotes. We'll be meeting with current and former senior officials in Estonia. And I'll just say one other thing, because the timing is so interesting. I, I accepted this invitation last year. Right. And now, wow, it's uh, it, it suddenly feels really urgent. And like, yeah. like, like there's a prophetic moment, a Kairos moment, yeah. that we need to be mobilizing Christians all up and down Eastern and Central Europe and throughout the world to really pray for peace and pray that the Lord pushes back evil, that God restrains evil. Yeah. The, the one last thing I'll say on that is that on the, one of the nights that I'm there, I'll be there for almost a week, they're having a thousand person church service that will be broadcast to the entire nation. Amazing. And uh, Rabbi Glick and I will be the two keynote speakers at that as well. So not only speaking to the Christian core audience that'll be coming to the to the, one of the most famous, I think the most famous church in, uh, in Estonia. Uh, if you look at the, the skyline photos, mm -hmm. this is the iconic steeple. And, but it will be broadcast to the nation. And so yeah. we'll have an opportunity to speak to the nation about these important themes that the Joshua Fund is trying to educate Christians uh, all over the world through this podcast. And occasionally yeah. you get invited to a parliament. So this is the <laughs> first time a non-Arab country has invited me to speak in its parliament I mean, technically, it's, it's the Christian that invited me, but uh, yeah. nevertheless, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And um, I look forward it's, to reporting back what we see and hear. Well, we can't wait to share that with our listeners. And uh, I'm looking forward to having the conversation with you while you're there and to get those impressions and things that are, that are happening. And, and Joel, never let it be said that you shy away from stepping into the center of of where things are moving around the world. As we look at Eastern Europe and we look at those forces, we look at the actions of, of uh, the Russian premier and, and all of that happening right now, you're, you're standing with those that are praying for the peace of Jerusalem. And I like to say about our work together is that I learned that things are not disconnected. They are 
very connected. And I think that these things are happening in, in a very connected way. And um, we want to look at what else is connected in, in, in the next episode. Of, of We're going to continue our conversation in our next episode about this. But we want to look and see, uh, given all that, that has happened, uh, as we just talked about in, in Ukraine and Russia and in the Baltic states and all other parts where we're seeing these things happen, as the pressure mounts on Israel... And the, the pressure and the U.S. and the, the Western allies of Israel recede into weakness. What does the Bible actually have to say about those things? I mean, that's one of the areas that you've spent many years really delving into. And I can't wait for our next episode when we share about those prophecies and those statements that God has made about this time and about these situations. So, My honor, Carl. Thank you for putting these issues front and center. On behalf of Joel Rosenberg and the entire uh, Joshua Fund ministry team, this is Carl Muller. Uh, thank you for listening to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. <laughs>